Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, Kirk, it's the first time I heard about Kirk from Radio Tarsaki here. If you still remember the name, he is a former PhD student. He is right now associate professor in Colorado Mass University, where Kirk he got his bachelor. So he contacted me and he told me, oh no, I have to. He's amazing. He is doing fantastic and undergraduate. And we decided to write a research proposal together to, you know, to write about like biodiversity algae and reducing some energy from aquaponic systems and so on. He did an amazing job of writing that proposal. Yes, we did not, you know, we were not able to get the fund, but he really did amazing. So then we received some funding from the Department of Defense and from Maryland Department of Agriculture. And then we told Kirk, yes, please come. And once he came to our lab, it was during COVID. And we just started going back to the labs with many experiments, with very short time to start uh, doing his work and, and start getting the experiment done and getting everything done. So once Kirk joined our lab, really within like the first two weeks, he was able to really understand the technology. He was able to run most of his experiment in very short time. And this is why he finished his master within like two years and like three months of camera. So he did really amazing job. Um, I, I, I really have he He finished his defense on April 11, uh, successful yeah. defense. So he will today present his work and yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Thank you everybody for coming today. So my name is Kirk Mahoney. I previously received a biology degree from Colorado Mesa University. Uh, so the title of this work is Novel Applications of Waste Treatment Technologies to Generate Energy and Treat Water. Uh, so I'll be presenting some of the information that I've collected over the past two years. If I were to present everything, you guys would be here for a few hours. You'd be hungry and aggravated. All right, so doc, Dr. Amr Hassan is with my advisor. So to give a little bit. Ah, all right, so an outline. So first I'll start with the background and literature review. Um, then I'll hop into the objectives and what we aim to achieve with this work. Uh, followed by that, I'll start with chapter two, titled Energy Production of Waste Treatment from Food Waste to Black Water Through Integrating Anaerobic Digestion, Hydrodynamic Cavitation, Microbial Electrolysis Cells, and Electrocoagulation. Next, I'll go into chapter three, titled Evaluation of Life Cycle Assessment for Industrial Scale Anaerobic Digestion of Dairy Manure and Food Waste with Solids Composting. Finally, I'll end up by going over the overall conclusions and some of the take-home messages of this report. So anaerobic digestion is a four-stage microbial process that takes a consortium of microbes and valorizes a wide range of biomasses, anything from food waste to sewage, and it turns it into renewable biogas. This biogas is composed of roughly 50 to 70% methane, and then a domination with the rest of it by CO2, and then trace gases, including hydrogen sulfide and water vapor. So while AD has a wide range of applications, the performance is variable and dependent upon a wide range of factors. So to ensure that we have the maximum energy production, we can combine AD with various other technologies, one of them being what are known as microbial electrolysis cells, or MEC. So microbial electrolysis cells involve an anode and a cathode. When you supply a small amount of voltage at the anode and the cathode, anywhere between 0.3 to 1.2 volts, you actually harbor what are called electrochemically active microorganisms. At the anode, these organisms actually oxidize the substrate and they produce the electrons that travel through the closed circuit and end up at the cathode where they're combined with free protons to form hydrogen gas. This hydrogen gas can be incorporated to form methane. So previously, MEC has been shown to not only accelerate the substrate degradation, but to also increase the methane production and the energy efficiency when combined with anaerobic digestion. So to further treat the waste before it goes into anaerobic digestion, we can incorporate what are called pretreatment technologies. One of these being what's called hydrodynamic cavitation. So hydrodynamic cavitation, other known, otherwise known as HDC, is kind of like a giant magic blender. So essentially we have a high-speed router motor and there's blades attached to this motor. As they spin at high RPM, they create gradients of high pressure and low pressure. When the substrate is entered or put into here and the blades start spinning, you have small uh, nuclei, gas nuclei that are in that substrate that travel from the high pressure gradient to the low pressure gradient. What happens is you get cavitation and nucleation. So these little nuclei expand. Then when they pass back to the high pressure gradient, they violently collapse, um, creating extremely high temperatures and pressures. You also have hydrolysis and the splitting of water molecules to form radicals. So this has been applied to AD as a pretreatment technology where it can actually increase the organic material availability in the form of chemical oxygen demand and also increase the methane production. 
So HDC has been compared to other pretreatment technologies, one of the main ones being thermohydrolysis pretreatment. It's found that the energy inputs with HDC are much, much lower compared to thermohydrolysis pretreatment. Now, when the AD process goes through, you have a liquid effluent that comes out the other side. In this effluent, it's typically extremely contaminant heavy, and it has a very, very high uh, nutrient content. So to treat this, we can apply what's known as electrocoagulation. So when you have a substrate that's a liquid substrate that's ready to be treated, you have these contaminants that are colloidal, stable, and negatively charged, what's called an electric double layer. They're very stable and happy as they are. So when you have an electrocoagulation reactor, you have an anode, also known as a sacrificial electrode, and a cathode. When you supply voltage to the system, it kicks off a three-step process. The anode, or the sacrificial electrode, releases metal cations into the solution. These metal cations overcome the van der Waals forces of these negatively charged contaminants, and it causes them to start uh, coagulating. Once these flocculants build, you have at the cathode, small hydrogen and oxygen bubbles that actually float these flocculants to the top where they can be cleared off and you have a liquid beneath that is reduced of COD, total suspended solids, and uh, color. So electrocoagulation, the process is variable. There's a wide range of electrode configurations. Uh, there's a wide range of materials that can be used. There's also the performance of EC can be impacted by additives such as increasing electrolytic conductivity, injecting air, and different reagents that can be added. Now, while these technologies have been applied at the lab scale and the bench scale, anaerobic digestion has had a much bigger application at the industrial scale. So with that, <clears throat> industrial scale AD presents an approach to treating a wide range of biomasses, anything from crop waste to livestock manure. So typically it's operated in either what's called monodigestion or co-digestion. Monodigestion is just degrading a single substrate. Co-digestion is two or more substrates. So in the United States, we have a very uh, prominent livestock industry with uh, dairy and cattle being one of those, which means we have a lot of waste from them. So this dairy manure waste is typically 70 to 80% liquid. It has a relatively high heating value, but the problem is when it's monodigested in AD, it has a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio. Essentially, this results in challenges by low biogas production, process instability, and the buildup of recalcitrant compounds, mainly lignocellulose. So food waste, on the other hand, is another ubiquitous waste stream in this country. So up to 40 million metric tons are produced out of 200 million metric tons per year, municipal solid waste. Unfortunately, a very, very small fraction of this food waste is integrated in anaerobic digestion. This represents a huge loss of nutrients because this food waste is composed of lipids and proteins and carbohydrates that can be used as a substrate for methane production. But when you monodigest food waste, you have what's the buildup of what are called volatile fatty acids. These acids can drop the digester pH and it can eventually harm the microorganisms and decrease the efficiency or kill those microorganisms. So when they're put together, dairy manure and food waste have a considerable potential to generate energy. This energy can be burned in what's called the, um, or the biogas can be burned to produce energy in what's called CHP or combined heat and power generator. Now, to better understand how the system operates, we can apply different tools to analyze the efficiency and the impacts. One of those being what's called a life cycle assessment. So a life cycle assessment provides a tool that it characterizes and evaluates uh, different processes or products from a cradle to grave aspect. So it's been found that when we incorporate this combined heat and power generator, that there is positive benefit because the electricity production also, we find that monodigestion is not as adequate when you compare it with um, co-digestion. So with that in mind, this research seeks to cover not only the gaps in the energy production and water treatment from that food waste and black water waste stream, but to also um, <clears throat> excuse me, assess the efficacy of the integration of these various technologies, including the HDC, the MEC, anaerobic digestion, AD, and also the electrocoagulation. On top of that, we seek to evaluate an industrial scale AD system, co-digesting food waste and dairy maneuver with a novel design for um, solids composting. And finally, we wanted to apply this LCA tool to actually look at the different process components and the environmental impacts of them. So chapter two is tile energy production and waste treatment from food waste and black water through integrating anaerobic digestion, hydrodynamic cavitation, microbial electrolysis cells, electrocoagulation. So to give a little bit a quick run of the experimental, experimental procedure. So first we uh, blended our uh, food waste and black water together. We had a target COD there. Um, so then we settled it for 30 minutes in what are called IMHOF cones. 
This allowed for the isolation of the solid and the liquid fractions from that food waste and black water. So the solids were collected and pretreated with hydrodynamic cavitation, further increasing our chemical oxygen demand. Same with the liquids, we pretreated them with the HDC, saw an increase. Now with the solids, we did uh, energy generation either by anaerobic digestion only or the integrated anaerobic digestion with the microbial electrolysis cell. The waters were treated with electrocoagulation to assess the ability to reduce the parameters. So I've supplied a table here, just a quick overview of the four experiments. Uh, so the first energy generation experiment that we performed was AD only. Uh, so it tested the solids with and without hydrodynamic habitation. It seek to test three different time frames of five, 10, and 30 days, and to analyze the impact of HDC and the increase of methane generation. The second energy experiment involved the integrated ADMEC. So we seek to test three different voltages, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and 1.2 volts to see if it actually increases the energy production over 80 ohm. So the first water treatment experiment involved the electrocoagulation with three different voltages and three different time frames of sample collection. Then we performed another EC experiment where we actually uh, added the electrolytes to assess the ability for the uh, increased electroconductivity on further reducing the water parameters. So when we performed the hydrodynamic cavitation, it was at 3,700 RPM for 55 minutes, reaching subcritical temperatures of over 100 degrees. So when it came time to uh, prepare our first AD-only experiment, energy generation, uh, so the post-HDC and no-HDC solids were loaded two to one. Uh, so we performed uh, triplicates of everything run for uh, 30 days at uh, 35 degrees centigrade. That's the inoculum was procured here in the bioenergy and bioprocessing lab from a semi-continuous semi lab-scale digester. So the reactors consisted of 250 milliliter serum bottles that were capped with a rubber septum. At the beginning of the experiment, biogas was collected every day and analyzed for CH4 content. As the experiment progressed, the gas started to decrease every other day. Um, so we collected the uh, three different time frames with uh, excuse me, solids and nutrient analysis conducted for each treatment group. So I provided two figures here on the top. In the y-axis, we have the milliliters of methane normalized by grams of volatile solid. On the x-axis, we have the three different treatment group, uh, three different treatment times, and then the respective post-HDC and no HDC. In the bottom figure on the y-axis, we have our cumulative methane normalized by grams of volatile solids, and then the days of the experiment that was run. So what we found was that when we applied that HDC to pretreat the waste, it consistently generated more methane. Uh, so in the first 10 days of the experiment, we found that over 81% of the cumulative methane was produced. Uh, so after the 30-day experiment, uh, that post-HDC solids produced 63% more. We recognize the same um, pattern in the five-day and the 10-day re uh, retention times where the post-cab consistently generated more methane. Uh -oh. So when we performed the second energy generation experiment, uh, we once again loaded the substrates and the inoculum in a two to one ratio. But this time we incorporated the microbial electrolysis cell. So the uh, anode was composed of just a graphite rod attached to titanium wire. The cathode was just a piece of fine steel mesh wrapped around that um, titanium piece of wire and then inserted through the septum in the uh, reactors you can see here. That's our anode, and that's our cathode. The reactors were continuously maintained at the respective voltages with once again triplicates performed for each treatment group, mesophilic condition. <clears throat> but for the last experiment, as almost 81.5% of the methane was produced in 10 days, we figured we'd apply a 10 day time frame for this experiment. So here's the different iterations of our ADMEC design. Uh, we went through three or four different designs. And what was found was that we consistently dealt with problems of gas leakage. Uh, just low biogas production. So we finally came upon this idea and developed our anode and our cathode with the graphite rod and the fine steel mesh. We shrink wrap the uh, titanium wire so there was no short circuiting. <laughs> and this design actually worked fantastic. So I've supplied this figure on the y-axis. Once again, we have the uh, uh, milliliters of methane production normalized by the grams of volatile solid. On the x-axis, we have our days of experiment. So the post uh, HTC solids consistently generated more methane. Uh, so with the uh, MEC run at 0.9 volts, we saw 82% of that cumulative methane, <clears throat> excuse me, in just five days. Uh, with the MEC at 1.2 volts, we saw almost 13% more than just the AD only. Uh, so with the MEC at 0.9, almost 10% more methane from the post HDC solids compared to the AD only. 
So when we performed the electrocoagulation experiments, uh, so we tested three different substrates. So the reactors were uh, fabricated here in-house. They had a total volume of 600 milliliters uh, with a 450 milliliter working volume. Uh, so we tested four different voltages, 10, 15, 20, and 25 volts with collections from a time frame over 15 to 90 minutes. So samples were collected beneath the uh, surface of the liquid so as to not collect those flocculants that were uh, brought to the top. And then in the second EC experiment, we did increase the electrolytic conductivity with the addition of potassium chloride at a concentration of one gram per liter. So here's our actual EC design. Um, so the uh, anode, the sacrificial electrode was aluminum. And then the cathode was a steel brush inserted with uh, both the anode and the cathode being connected to the power supply with uh, voltage maintained constantly. So in this graph on the y-axis, we have the COD removal uh, by percentage. And then on the x-axis, we have our three different voltages with the respective no HDC and post-HDC liquids. Uh, so what we found was that 15 volts in 90 minutes actually produced the highest level of chemical oxygen demand removal. Um, so the uh, post-HDC liquid saw over 96% removal, while the no HDC liquid saw just under 93% removal. Um, so interestingly, compared to the initial COD, chemical oxygen demand of the raw food waste in black water, we saw statistical significance between both the no HDC and the post-HDC. Although between the two groups of post and no, there was no statistical significance. Uh, so more importantly, too, what we found was that uh, there was 100% removal of the total suspended solids. Okay, so in this figure, COD removal on the y-axis by percentage. And on the x-axis, we have our three different treatment groups, raw liquids, post-HDC liquids, no HDC liquids, and our time frames. So this was performed uh, at 10 volts. So after 15 minutes when the samples were collected, we found that the post-HDC liquids, again, removed the highest level of COD, closely followed by the no HDC liquid. But interestingly, that raw food waste in black water only saw 27% removal of the COD. Um, so once again, between the two treatment groups of post HDC and no HDC, 100% TSS removal. And then also we saw significant color removal too from that liquid. Um, but we found out that the KCL did have a positive impact. And overall, as we found that the HDC did substantially increase the substrate availability, uh, increases of almost 900% of COD in the solids and just under 58% of the liquids. Uh, so applying the HDC pretreatment before the solids for anaerobic digestion did significantly improve the methane generation, uh, where that's we saw not only acceleration of methane production, but a higher level of methane. Uh, so when we applied integrated the MEC with AD, it can enhance the methane generation where we saw that the post-hydrodynamic cavitation solids increase that methane in just 10 days. Uh, so uh, electrocoagulation did substantially reduce the water parameters, uh, where we actually were able to increase the electroconductivity with the electrolytes, which actually reduced the amount of voltage and time frame that we had to supply to the electrocoagulation process. But overall, with such a small increase in the COD of the liquids, the HDC pretreatment was not a valuable allocation of resources for the liquids. So chapter three is titled Evaluation and Life Cycle Assessment for Industrial Scale Anaerobic Digestion of Dairy Manure and Food Waste with Solids Composting. So to give a little outline of the system, so you have your cows in the barn, the uh, manure along with the bedding is washed down to the barn, reaches a separation lane where the bedding stays behind, the combined solid and liquid manure is processed in a solid liquid separation unit. The solids, approximately 27% of the uh, dairy manure waste stream is removed and used for composting where the liquid is inserted directly into the digester. Integrated with that dairy manure liquid, we have two solid food waste um, containers. One of them contained what was called dissolved air flotation waste. Uh, so if you ever walked by our lab and it smelled like a sewer line was broke, that was the DAF. Uh, so the cranberry processing was the other food waste. So these were um, both integrated in roughly 74% and uh, dairy manure and about 26% of the food waste. Uh, so the compost was uh, turned twice a week with the finished compost being sold as a value-added com uh, value component. So samples were collected once a month over the course of 12 months. Also, so we started collecting um, data for uh, a, a group of online parameters, including the biogas production, the methane content, the energy production, and then also the uh, hydrogen sulfide. This data was collected every 15 minutes and then compiled to um, obtain uh, yearly, monthly, and daily values for each of these production numbers.
So in this diagram here, um, just very basic, we have the anaerobic digestion system. So the biogas is upgraded and removed of sulfide, and then it's burned in that CHP unit. The electricity is sold as a value-added component, while the heat of the CHP is actually used to heat the digester, um, reducing the input from fossil fuel generation. Um, in the top left corner, that's what the digester actually looks like. It's, what, it's what's known as a lagoon style. We just put a giant plastic cover over it. The gas is collected, burned in the CHP. That's what the CHP actually looks like in the bottom left corner. It's just a giant engine. Bad news. All right, take this from here on out. I know, right? This is there, okay. <laughs> So I just had to say that says the one. Can you plug Can you just uh, like escape, stop sharing, exit, and reopen it, I guess? Yeah, I just restart the power. Yeah. Cancel. Yeah. You save your version. Three of you know. Sorry about that, folks. No problem. Difficulties. Yeah. Oh, geez. That's it. What's below there? Actually, you know where? Oh. Yeah, I agree. Maybe it's a little bit. Yeah. Uh, this is not how it's supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're listening. We could use your time. <laughs> oh, he's not logged in. Oh. Do I have the ability just to like hook it up to my laptop? Why don't you try that? Yeah. yeah. And I'll go get it help. Yeah. 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 Slide yeah. 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 Just go ahead. Just, uh, just go ahead. Screen share. I know that was quick. It is. Yeah. It's already. Oh. oh. Well, maybe if I keep talking, it'll load. You don't pay attention to that. So, um, so the system produced just under like 2 million uh, meters cubed of biogas per year. Uh, so the methane efficiency was six, 631 liters of methane uh, per kilogram of volatile solids. So the um, uh, uh, methane content in the biogas was roughly 56.2%. Um, so when we looked at the energy production uh, for the CHP, so over 72% of that biogas was combusted and used for electricity production. That equated to just under 2 million kilowatt hours per year. Uh, so the maximum capacity of the CHP generator was 230 kilowatt hours. So at 224 kilowatts per hour on average, the CHP was nearly operating consistently at a maximum capacity. Oh, is this stalled again? Yeah. Another issue again. Work your magic. <laughs> Oh, I can't send it out. I don't know what the name of the issue is. Have you shut it down and reopened it? I yeah. have to. Yeah, it just keeps doing the same thing. Now. Look at that. Yeah. 
It is already being sure. I think I'm being well, we can. Uh, that's going to create problems. We'll see. What's the, the problem with that? Um, so, just a trip to move to the next one. Yes. We can set this up. Uh, it's just going to stop sharing on Zoom. So, I can't get that set up quickly. So good. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Take two. So we looked at the uh, nutrient and the solids content. So food waste uh, had actually the highest nutrients and the solids. Uh, so the dairy manure had a relatively low uh, TS and VS, total solids and volatile solids, as well as nutrient content. Um, so that told us that the food waste was contributing a majority of the um, volatile solids and substrate for uh, conversion to methane. Okay, cool. So when we looked at the um, <clears throat> pH and the temperature of the digester, so it was maintained at mesophilic conditions, just over 36 centigrade uh, over the course of monitoring. Um, so as far as the pH, the cranberry food waste uh, had the lowest average pH over the 12 months of monitoring, while the effluent had the highest average pH. Dairy manure was roughly 7.6. Um, so I will point out too, we have one month <clears throat> of DAF missing as the uh, uh, substrate was too low in the food waste container to actually collect. So when we applied the uh, LCA, so two LCAs were run. Uh, one had a functional unit of one year. The other had a functional unit of one ton of organic waste, which included the dairy manure and the food waste. Uh, so the, this figure supplies the boundaries of the LCA with the inputs for the system on the top and then the outputs for the system uh, along the uh, right side. And then we have the interactions of all the different components of the digestion system. So five scenarios are analyzed. So the baseline scenario, uh, excluded anaerobic digestion and composting. That meant that all the dairy manure and food waste was stored in a giant open lagoon. So we also analyzed the uh, current condition of how the farm currently operates. We analyzed another scenario, which was called scenario A, that is AD of food waste and dairy manure, but excluded the solids composting aspect. We performed another scenario, scenario B, which was dairy manure monodigestion, no food waste, but it did include solids composting. And the final scenario, scenario C, was the monodigestion of dairy manure, and it excluded no solids composting. So uh, 10, impact if 10 different impact categories were analyzed with two separate assessments, actually digging into the global warming, the uh, CO2 emissions, and then the eutrophication, the nitrogen emissions. So in this figure, on the y-axis, we have the impact percent. And then on the x-axis, we actually have the different categories that were analyzed. Um, so what we found was compared to the baseline is that the current project, the current condition was up. The baseline had the highest emissions across the board, um, with the exception of two categories, which I will go over. So scenarios B and C only had one advantageous category, and that was non-carcinogens. Um, so for the current condition, eight out of 10 categories proved optimal in the way that it currently runs today. So this table actually produces the uh, quantities of the different uh, categories that were analyzed. Um, so I will point out that we mainly paid attention to the baseline condition and the current project. Um, so what we found was that in eight of those categories, it was great. But in fossil fuel depletion and ozone depletion, there was a slight difference. And what we found out was that when the food waste comes to the farm, it's transported over a long distance. That diesel that's used in the processing that increased the fossil fuel depletion. On top of that, the construction and concrete 
of those food waste containers, as well as the construction of the compost facility, did give a slight edge to the baseline scenario, but it was roughly two to 6% difference. So when we analyze the global warming, uh, so the baseline scenario was by far the largest emitter of uh, CO2. So the storage of the organic waste made the biggest contribution, as well as the uh, building of a giant lagoon to actually hold that waste. When we compared the current condition, the current project uh, with the CO2, we saw a greater than 81% reduction, where a large part of that avoided emissions came from that electricity production and the avoided emissions by burning that biogas and containing that organic waste that equated to over 2,000 tons of CO2 avoided. Uh, so the food waste did contribute over 680 tons of CO2. That was mainly due to that transportation and the construction of the containment facilities. So we analyzed the uh, eutrophication, the baseline scenario, by far the largest emitter. Once again, that storage of the dairy manure and the food waste made a huge impact on how much emissions were being uh, produced from that. So we saw an over 440% reduction in the nitrogen emissions when we analyzed our current project compared to the baseline scenario. Um, a majority of that was not only due to that electricity production from the co-digestion, but also the composting avoided any sort of disposal. Not only that, but it also added that value, a value added component with roughly 5,000 cubic yards of compost being produced each year. So what we found uh, so that the industrial scale AD system was an effective way for renewable energy production. Uh, so when we integrated the CHP, it did have a positive impact due to not only electricity, but also being able to heat the digester. Uh, so the food waste had the largest contribution to the co-digestion with over 82% of the gas being contributed to that food waste integration. So the relatively high biogas yield from the system meant that with the majority of the CHP used, that electricity production was awesome. So when we applied the LCA, it identified the optimal scenario, uh, seeing that the current condition in the current project had the largest uh, reductions almost across the board for that organic waste storage of the uh, dairy manure and the food waste in the baseline was once again, the largest contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen, CO2, acidification. So the overall conclusions. Um, so the hydrodynamic cavitation pretreatment is a promising approach uh, as we saw large increases in both the solids and the liquids with the chemical oxygen demand and the organic material availability from that food waste and black water waste stream. When we apply it just to the isolated solids, we saw a significant difference in energy generation so we also found that applying the electrocoagulation to the liquid effluent is very effective at reducing the water parameters, where we did see highest results with 15 volts in 90 minutes. When we added the electrolytic conductivity, we reduced our material and energy input and got close to the same results. Also, the HDC pretreatment liquid was not the best allocation of energy. When we integrated the ADMEC, it did improve the energy generation. Although what we did find was that we need more than 10 days to successfully harbor those electrochemically active micro microorganisms. Additionally, co-digestion co was more ideal than just monodigestion alone. Uh, the dairy manure and the food waste together yielded great results so, uh, instead of just single uh, digestion of each individual substrate. Um, so the net energy production of the system was positive, that CHP, with the heat and the electricity was incredibly beneficial in making the uh, system sustainable. Um, so the LCA did show that the current operation should be maintained, that integrating any other scenario uh, decreased the impact, or, uh, increase the impacts and decrease the benefit that was received from that system. Um, ultimately, the way that the system runs has the largest reductions and is the most sustainable approach. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Amar Hassanin, my committee members, uh, Dr. Stephanie Lansing and Dr. Guangbin Lee. I'd like to thank all the faculty and staff here at ENST and AGNR, um, as well as the ENC program. Uh, so all the undergraduate and graduate students that have stuck by my side, even though I put them through lots in the lab. Um, so I'd also like to thank my family and my friends back home for being my unsung support 2,000 miles away. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank the Maryland Department of Agriculture and the United States Department of Defense for supplying the funding for this research. With that, Thank you very much. Great job. Great job, Kurt. Great landing on your feet. And this was some technical challenges up here. I think we all were glad that wasn't us trying to manage that. Very you did a great job. So uh, just a couple of things. We have time for some questions. But great. I'll remind everyone there's a, an evaluation form that you should have a link to in 
your email and it also put it in the chat if you're online uh, tuned into this and with that i have a question and, and while you're thinking about your question so uh in this cavitation process i mean i normally think of cod as fundamentally inherent to the materials as a function of the carbon content mm -hmm. so what is this cavit you're not actually creating carbon in this cavitation process, I assume. So I'm assuming it has some physical effect that you're breaking this down and making it more available. And does, what does that also say about the way we normally measure COD? If there's a lot of COD that isn't measured until you get this radical cavitation treatment. Yeah, so you're exactly right. So it's essentially with that process and those extreme temperatures and pressures, we're just destroying all these little cells in there, all these larger carbon molecules and actually increasing that free available carbon. Um, so from your point that, uh, what does that say about the COD measurement? We'd like to apply HTC to everything. It's a good pretreatment, but it's also intensive. Um, with that, there's also, like a, there's different ways of cavitation with the specific way that we use with the router motor. It does have a lot of energy input. And over time, those materials weigh out, uh, they wear out. Uh, the blade has to be replaced. The motor has to be replaced. So it's, again, that's the COD, the measurement overall. I think soluble COD would also be a good measurement for the HTC, which, uh, in hindsight, we would like to apply again if we were to redo it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, so I think I sort of know the answer, but so if there were a digester at the cranberry facility, it's kind of like walk through, a, I assume that would be inferior to do all this separately in each facility, but it would avoid the transport point parts. And it's not it would. Kind of like, it would. Uh, why that would not be as good. Yeah, so the cranberry especially, what we saw was that the pH was super low. So it was under four. And when we have that low pH, we get these buildup of these compounds that are the carbon intermediates to produce methane, but they also have a big impact on the pH. These methanogenic microorganisms that produce that methane are very, very sensitive to that pH. So if we were to solely digest, say, just cranberry, the acidity would be so great, the acidity was so low that it would harm all those methanogens. It would not be a very effective digester. I'll turn to what she said. I think we, we had talked about afterwards, um, after my defense, about ways that we can you know, optimize the LCA scenario. The biggest one was reducing that transport distance of the food waste. So if we could procure that food waste from a closer area, that would make a big difference in those environmental emissions. So I, I'm kind of curious, and I don't know the answer to this question. So curious, you know, say. When you looked at Andy Moss's district, or master's thesis, he did an energy evaluation for the digester two years ago, Dr. Lance's lab. That showed not a very rosy picture for digestion in terms of its net energy, where you're painting a very rosy picture with the LCA analysis. I was wondering, I don't know if you had a chance to dive into that at all. If you can compare, why are they so different? Why are the LCA so different from his, his energy analysis? So I haven't looked at his energy analysis personally. Yeah, I say that's oh. I have not looked into that. I say don't you know I feel a bit bad. But um, you know, it's uh, the big thing with the with the lagoons is when you get the anaerobic conditions, you get the emissions, you know, the methane emissions. And what we calculated, we went through and figured out, hey, if they're producing this much manure from each cow, we put that in an open lagoon, we combine it, they're still getting that food waste, which can be applied you know, maybe on the crops, it can be drawn down and manure injected, but all that food waste sits there a majority of the time and the dairy manure sits there a large part of the year. And that's the largest part of the emissions that was coming without the containment of the digestion system with those anaerobic conditions just arising from the storage of all that waste. So when we did implement that, and that's, we calculated all this out, we went through AgStar and found the, you know, the methane production from manure and the CO2 content and the nitrogen content, how much of this actual manure would be deposited into the environment. And when that was all placed in one area and then also valorized to produce that biogas and electricity, it was a large reduction. It was a large change in what we saw. So when you look across the LCAs, comparing all those, you get your 10 parameters you look at mm -hmm. in terms of benefits, right? So when you compare all those 10, like which ones is the CO2, the methane, the most important in terms of how LCA kind of evaluates? So those were just the benefits. two, those were the two that I chose. You know, so I'm not saying the other eight are any less important. You had a graph where you had like eight or nine on that graph and bunch of bars. Yeah. So those were all the different impact assessments. And I chose to center on yeah, two of them. Yeah. yeah. So these are the actual. All these on an equal basis, like impact percent. What is impact percent? 
So that's like a, so the percent reduction. So it's the baseline scenario. Most of them that was 100 percent impact. But then comparing each of those categories, it's not necessarily across the categories. Yeah, yeah. So each uses yeah. to say that smog is more important than no, no, no. Gosh, no, no, no. And that's this, this is just comparing. This is the percent reduction compared to our baseline scenario. This is how much more or less we see from each one of these scenarios. And that's with the again with eight out of ten categories. So LPA have the ability to compare across these categories. Anyway, to synthesize. So we didn't analyze that specifically. Um, that's best we had was yeah. Did so. This is the table actually provided. It provides the quantities, the individual quantities of each of the categories. This might be better to do a comparison to and actually see you know, how much the reduction in each category compared to this base, this scenario, this scenario, this scenario, and this scenario. That could be a way to do a cross scenario analysis comparing each one individually. Yeah, also right now we are doing um, life cycle assessment to compare between different systems. Like for example, the animals, the uh, aerobic digester, we are comparing it to this system, for example. And normally the emissions coming from the system depend on the infrastructure, the loading rate, the distance of shipping the manure, and the type of substrate. Like if we have dirty manure, the amount of emissions will be much more in CH4, I mean, in the methane and the CO2 compared to the road load or compared to other type of this. So the type of the infrastructure, the type of organic material, all this could affect the life cycle analysis. And we agree. Did again the life cycle assessment um, for for the same system that you just mentioned, and we try to find what is the optimum scenario that we can be reducing the amount of emissions out of that system. And we found the most contributing factor were like the infrastructure and um, the transportation systems. So when we control those two systems, we can try to find what is the best scenario. Also, we have another farm control department. Uh, of agriculture to compare between the manure management uh, systems and situation of over Maryland and try to find what system could be used and what parameters we need to take into consideration for the future. And based on the life cycle assessment, as Kirk said, we can isolate each parameter. Like if we would like to, to see what is global warming, what is the most contributed here, we can just go inside the software and double click on the bar and then it will give us that quantity and the contributor of that thing. So to be honest, Kirk did very well and, and understanding the software, really the software take like one or two years to play with and understand the software. He did all of that analysis like within six months. I believe there is a room to improve the model and, and improve that the scenario as well. Got an LCA crash course. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? So, I mean, I see that this really, we can imagine this big lagoon with no top on it, just letting all this methane and everything out is an issue. But what's the motivation then? I know there's energy back that you get from putting the cap on it, but after that investment of materials and energy or whatever they you need know, to buy the machines, is that worthwhile for a company that's doing that to do that? Or are there regulations that are making them do it? I guess I'm trying to see. Why would one person build this big thing with all these things on it and another company might say, well, we don't want to do that because it's not cost effective or we're not required to do it or something. I'm just trying to get the bigger picture of it. Yeah. yeah. So as far as the environmental regulation part, I'm not well versed in that. Um, but as far as the, the energy component, the economic component, um, you know, it, it depends on the size of the farm. It depends on how much manure you're processing. But one of these systems, ideally, it can last you know, over a decade. And if you're generating a consistent amount of electricity and being able to sell that, that system will eventually pay off in a matter of several years. But it's also a large capital investment. Yeah. And that's why that is, that's a big issue. That's one of those activation barriers is that's just, that is a huge, it's an over a million dollar investment to get this CHP, to get the scrubbing system, to get the cover. But ultimately that would be paid off if you had an efficient system. In this case with our system being briefly about 750 cows plus the food waste is very efficient. They were talking about putting a second one in because they were making so much biogas and being able to burn so much of this and sell back the electricity that they want to put a second one in. But that is, that's, that's the big issue. That it's a big capital investment, but it would get paid off. So just come down on the methane. I think you know, that's such a focus now. Uh, yeah. I wonder if there will be regulations or incentives or something. I mean, I don't, does anybody else know about it? Yeah, Maryland Department of Agriculture, they provide funding and they basically funded the digester. 
they provide like 1.6 million euros as as you know as a starting for the course of investor and it's, um it's called manure management fund but manure or no waste waste management fund and it's it's open every year for all the farmers to apply and that is where we receive the money to do the evaluation of the system and we are redoing uh, assessment of the overall funding to just give them more recommendations in terms of the, um, the RFB, in terms of the evaluation criteria, in terms of the environmental justice, in terms of all the categories. And so hopefully next year we'll be more integrating the global warming. Thank you.